Hello today. Thanks for coming. Uh, these are blue. Is, does blue work? Can you see blue? Is that all right? That's visible. Not so good. Uh, half of these pens are blue. In a way, I want to write in two colors, but I will never be able to pull that off. So, <laughs> oh, okay. These are multicolored. Oops. Okay, so black. Better. If it isn't better, we don't have any choice. <laughs> That's the only thing we're going to do. Okay, so good. So what I want to do is now let's figure out where we were. So what we've been doing, so so far, are we've been developing uh, what is uh, sometimes called computational type theory, which means I'm developing the notion of types from a computational perspective. Okay, so the, the view of it was that types are behavioral specifications. So I was saying that the thing that I find appealing about this is that I just, I guess I'm a computer scientist and I'm interested in using types from, uh, as kind of specifications and I want to know what things have, what the meanings that things have uh, from a computational point of view. So I'm starting with that and I realize that it's a little non-standard way to talk about it for most people and I'm going to kind of bring it around and try to connect that up with formal type theory today and I use that as a jumping off point to talk about what's called uh, identifications and paths and I'll start talking about that next time. So that's my plan. So, so what we did is, as I mentioned uh, last time, just to remind you, is that the, the, the key set up, uh, what we have are these two um, principal forms of judgment, okay? So we have these principal forms of judgment, so we have this notion of, I was using the word exact because, especially pretty soon, uh, I'll have other notions of equality floating around. People use the word equality in various ways. So I was emphatically using this exact type equality, which we've been writing like this, and, and we define that A type, you remember, means simply that A is equal to A. And I found from discussions yesterday that many people found that to be confusing. So let me, let me just say it's kind of a technical device. I could independently define what what a type means and then for those things for which a type is the case I could talk about when they're equal and then it would be an equivalence relation and then it would be not objectionable like you wouldn't find that odd at all but if you write out all of that what you end up doing is you end up repeating yourself a lot when you write down what does a type mean and then when you talk about what are equal types you're re it's kind of redundant so it turns out to be more technically efficient to simply write down when two things are equal and then those for which are equal to themselves are the things we call types. Where it happens to be reflexive are the types. So rather than assume they're types and make it reflexive, I define equality and say, oh, and when it's reflexive, that's what it means to be a type. So it's, it's a trick, I guess you could say, and it's a common, a common trick. So that's what we do. So I, don't, get, don't get tripped up on that, okay? But that, that's the idea. And then I also use this term exact member or element equality. And I also found in discussions yesterday, so we wrote it like this, M equals M prime in A, and, and then as I mentioned, just plain M in A just means uh, M is equal to itself, and it's, it's the exact same story. And I found that some people I found this notationally may be confusing because the mix fix notation. So another possible notation would be to put a subscript on the equal sign so that it's emphasizing M and M prime are equal when considered as elements of type A. So that's the, that's the idea. And what is crucial in this is that, well, first of all, these are given meaning in terms of computation. So these are always defined in terms of computation. So the meanings of the types are defined, and I'll, I'll, I'll get to that in a moment. Uh, the, 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 thing I wanted to, uh, the thing I wanted to say here, right, is that the... Uh, I guess I would say expressions or various, you know, programs uh, do not, and this will be in contrast to formal type theory, uh, intrinsically have a, 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 so to say, intrinsically have a type. 
have, I don't know, have is the word, a type. We'll talk about this in a formal meeting. In other words, the same program can satisfy many specifications. That's, that's, the, that's the idea here. It's like, so it's not like there's the one and only one type. It's always, I'm considering these to be elements of type A, or when considered as elements of type A, they are equal. Okay? Or this would mean they obey, they're equal to themselves, so they obey the property of being elements of type A. So for example, I mean, I could describe a program, a particular program M, as carrying nats to nats if I want. But it could also be that the same program M takes, I don't know, primes to primes. I just made that up. Okay. And it could take bazillions of, it could have a bazillion properties that could be considered maybe more or less refined than, than merely being nat to nat. So it, it's, it's not like, you know, it, it intrinsically has a certain type, which is what you're familiar with with type checking. And that's a matter of implementation. So I'm going to come back to that because I think it's important to that you understand the interplay that I'm, that I'm, you know, that I'm using here, that, that what's really going on. Okay, so you just have to remember that because otherwise it can, it can get confusing. And whether two things are equal or not depends on what type you're comparing them at. So the thing I, I like to say is, you know, something like, you know, the identity function maybe, lambda a, a, would actually be equal to, let's say, the absolute value function, provided that the inputs are natural numbers. Let's say this would be nat to int, and suppose I had an int, or I could just write nat here as nat to nat, because it's not doing anything, okay? So it, there actually is, it is the identity. So again, it's, it's not as though this intrinsically has some particular type, and then it doesn't even make sense to compare them. I can compare all sorts of things. And so that's an example. But at another type, if we had int around, Okay, so it would be like int int or int nat, if you like. Then these, it would not be the case that these are equal, obviously. Okay, so uh, I should write int int, actually. So it would not be the case that these are the, are, are the same when viewed as elements of that type. Of course, I have to define what int is, and while well, there's lots of ways of doing that, I could say they are differences of, formal differences of natural numbers. If you want something like that, I could, I could write down the type system for that, but I, which I haven't done. But spare me that, and then I think it makes sense to you. OK, so, so that's, the, uh, that's the sort of basic setup. Okay, And then I was emphasizing, so uh, I was talking about is there's a kind of, you know, uh, the, uh, the definitions of various types. And the question of uh, why there are definitions at all. Okay, so we gave a whole bunch of these. I won't repeat them, of course. But we looked at, you know, for example, I think I started with Boolean. We looked at natural numbers. Okay, these are both examples of inductive types. <clears throat> okay, and uh, so in other words, they're inductively defined in and of themselves. And then we looked at various kinds of type combinations. So I didn't actually mention it, but you can define for yourself as an exercise the, uh, the one element type. That's also called uh, unit. OK, the one element type. That's the thing that in common programming language, I, the thing that in common, common, common programming languages are uh, the thing uh, uh, that common programming languages call void. You know, sorry about that, but that's like a weird thing. So in, you know, C or something, it's always, you know, void star this and void star that, but they really mean unit, okay? Yeah, uh, it's just a historical thing. Okay, and then we talked about combinations like forming a Cartesian product, okay? So you can write this down, what this must be, and I would suggest to you the standard thing is to use the value, the, the null tuple, and then you can just say it's the type that has only the null tuple in it. So you could... You should write that down. That would be a good thing for you to do. And then we, we talked about the products. And when we define these things, so I will make a remark over here. And we talked about functions. And so here we talked about functions. And I want to give you as an exercise, you should also do what, is, what I could call zero, which is also known as void. So that's the actual void. And this would be the empty type. OK. And interestingly enough, so I will give you this as an exercise. And interestingly enough, you know, this, it doesn't have, it won't have any introductory forms because, of course, it's intended to be the empty type, but it will have an elimination form, which is the, uh, I would write as a nullary case analysis. So like there are various notations I could use. So there's no cases 
And by contrast, I'll, I'll show here, I would also ask you to do as an exercise sums, okay, and I'll leave that also as an exercise. I haven't talked about, I haven't talked about that in detail. And then the idea here is the notation I happen to use, you can look in PFPL, that's sort of where this notation comes from. So I have injection into the first sum n, injection into the second sum n, and then I have a case analysis, okay, and the case analysis is there's what you do when it's in the left and what you do it when it's in the right, and then the thing you're going to case analyze. So you're going to case analyze on this. And I'm going to ask you to write this out, but if you look in PFPL, uh, then you can see what the operational semantics of this ought to be. And so the idea is, of course, this should evaluate its argument, and then it dispatches on whether it's 1.m or 2.m, and then continues by substitution in the appropriate branch. So you should develop what those, uh, do these as, as exercises, and I can help you with it, of course, later on, as the case may be. So let's say we've done these, okay, we can, we can, we can do that. Oh, uh, yeah. When you say, let's say we've done those, and I want to do those as an exercise, what do you mean by do them? Uh, define these types and develop the appropriate typing rules, which I'll allude to in a minute. In other words, develop the, the lemmas you need to verify what are the, like I've been doing so far, what are the introductory and what are the elimination things. So I'm gonna recap, I'm gonna recap this in a minute. Okay, uh, so before I write what here, I want, to, I want you to notice what I, what I call this kind of, yesterday I was explaining to some students this kind of two-dimensional structure. When I define these things, you'll recall that the meaning of these things is defined in terms of uh, A1 and A2 in each case. So in other words, I kind of assume I've already got A1 and A2 completely understood, maybe they are Nat and Boole, respectively, let us say, and then I could form Nat cross Boole, and then I kind of go up, you know, go up in sort of complexity, if you want to say that. I get a more complicated type by explaining it in terms of the less complicated types. So there's an idea that, well, in here it's plainly structural, that these are components of the compound type, and so it kind of makes sense that if I can define the meanings of the components, I use those meanings to define the meaning of the compound. So here it's, at this level, it's pretty straightforward. And I sometimes describe it, I think some, some students yesterday, uh, I think found this helpful. I, I describe the, the structure that I have here as a kind of, uh, I myself, just my personal thing. I like to think of having like kind of two axes going on here, which is one is this kind of the, the structure of types, okay, going on here. So for example, I'm thinking of what are my, in, my principles of how I build things up in kind of layers. So in the beginning, I gave you Boolean outright. And it's defined by a, so to say, horizontal induction. We said it was the least type that contains things that evaluate to true and false. And NAT was defined as the least thing closed under zero and successor, so we could say we enumerate, if you wish, okay, all of the, all of the numbers, and in fact, it's more complicated than that. It's successor of M, where M evaluates to a NAT, but we, can, we have a, a structure here. So there's a, a horizontal induction going on that defines what NAT is and what Boole is and other such types. And then once I have around you know, my, so the next thing that could possibly come in would be bull cross nat, as I mentioned. And that's just defined, you know, I just define the kind of outright, pretty much. You could say it's an induction in which I have only tuples in there. Okay, but the point is, is that once I have these in play, then I can put this in play. So in the same way that I mean sort of suggestively enumerating the levels of the definition of the elements, um, enumerating the levels of the definition of the types. And so I could have in here now, bull arrow nat would come up, and then, I, then it would come up that I would have nat arrow nat, you know, arrow nat or something, and it just goes on in this manner. And so the, uh, so I kind of, sometimes I think of this as a vertical induction and a horizontal induction. So these are defined horizontally and then vertically they refer to each other. Maybe that's helpful to you. It gets a little bit more um, tricky when we go to the dependent case because we generalize these things. And we said, well, we can have uh, a generalized notion of product. I, if, I think it's just normally called dependent product. That's a confusing term for various reasons. It's also called just a sigma type. So sometimes people just resort to describing them by the shapes of their notation because it, the terminology can be confusing. Okay, but anyway, sometimes that's called a dependent product. And the, remember, the idea is that the elements are tuples where the left component is M1 
and the right component is determined what, by, what, by what, what, the, what the first component is. So there, and then we had a similar thing in which I do a one arrow A2, which is sometimes called the dependent function, or if you don't want to, like, or you can just call it by its shape, which is called a pi type. Yep. Okay, Andre, I'm going to ask you not to do this because, uh, but okay, you can ask a question, but. Yeah. What's that? If I think it's a typo, can I say it? I'm not able to hear. Typo? Is there, if there's a typo, can he point out typos? Oh, there, yeah, okay, can point out a typo. That would be great. Is it a dependent product uh, or a dependent if I, sum? What's that, sorry? Is it a dependent product or a dependent sum? Oh, well, that's my, pro my point is that uh, the terminology is some people call it a dependent sum. I mean, I don't know what the right thing is. Is that the question? I'm sorry, I wasn't able to hear it. Yeah, okay, good. Uh, so, uh, and so sometimes uh, people call that a sigma type or a pi type because it's often written like that, okay? I think it's certainly more common to write it like that, but like especially on your screen, this uh, is a pretty nice notation. So, uh, so you can write it like that. Okay, so the point I wanted to make is uh, the following thing, is that in this scenario, in order to define you know, let's say A, A1 cross A2, we must already have, so to say, if you want to think in terms of this induction, must already have infinitely many things. Well, in principle, let's say if this were nat, it would be infinitely many. So it must already have around, A1 must be defined. That's fine. With the ordinary product, A2 must also be defined. But now I have to worry because the, uh, the, the type here depends on A, and the type of the second component depends on what the first component is. So I have to have this has to be defined for every M1 in A1, which, for example, if A1 were nat, then it would be for everything in type nat. So there's infinitely many predecessors, right? It's kind of infinitely wide, but not infinitely deep. That's the way I would like to say it. Okay, so you can have this picture that you have A1, and then you have, uh, in some sense, derived from it because it's for every M1 and A1. I have A2 with some M1, and I have A2 with some other M1 prime, and, and so on. And all of those are considered to be defined as well as A1 itself, and then I can define what, the, uh, what, uh, what this means. And the same thing happens here. So the point is, is that de defined in terms of, these are defined in terms of A1 and all instances A2 with M, you know, I'll just write M for A. You know, in other words, all the possible instances that can come up where M is in A1. So that's the meaning when I was using the functionality judgments and so on, that I, uh, what's essentially going on here uh, when I talk about A1 type, and then I talk about generically in A1, I have that A2 as a type, then if you spell out what that means, and I'm ignoring the equality issue, but really it's a matter of pres preserving equality, as I've mentioned, then you get, that's the phenomenon you get. So this vertical induction it's a good intuition, but you have to keep in mind that this is what also what counts as coming before. Okay, so that's, that's important. It does mean, if you look at it, that this kind of methodology will run into trouble and doesn't work very well if you were to try to have some kind of quantification over all possible types. All right, it, it's not going to work out because then what could happen is you're claiming that what's prior to it is the thing itself or things even more complicated than itself. So that's a whole other story, and I'm not going to discuss anything related to that, except for one, one particular concept, which I think will come up a little bit later, which is the notion of a universe. So in order to deal with this issue, what you do is you stratify the very types themselves in a particular way so that when you want to do type quantification, you can't quite do that, but you can quantify over a collection of types that I know was previously given and then build another step on top of that. 
So that's a little obscure, but I, I, will, I will amplify that point when, when the time comes. But the point of universes is, is to deal with this, that issue and making sure that these things are all well-defined. So what I'm sketching to you is, okay, I gave you these characterizations of the various type constructors, and they were their reason you're supposed to believe that I said anything at all, so to speak, is you're supposed to understand how this kind of induction principles work so that you get the staging that's going on. Okay, so that, I think that's important. And I didn't go into great technical detail about this. This is the level I'm going to stop. I don't, I don't, uh, I don't want to go into any f further. Yep. Uh, that looks a lot like arrow and not product. Oh, it might have, where, where are you pointing? Uh, to define a colon. The, the picture I wrote or uh, where? The, the picture I oh up here, A1 cross A2. Well, it's the same also with arrow. It doesn't matter. Okay. The point is, is that for these dependent forms, whatever they are, whatever comes in the middle, I'm assuming I already have A1, and I'm assuming not only it's not like a single A2 that I'm assuming it's all the possible A2s of M's, where M is in A1. But why would there be a substitution for a product? Because it's a product. Either I've written something wrong or I'm, and I don't realize it, or I'm not understanding your question. I'm not, I'm not sure which is which. Sometimes I write something and I can only see what I meant, meant to write. I hope I didn't. All good. All good. Is it okay? Yeah. yeah. I don't know, you may know the phenomenon. You see what you want to see. It's like looking at code. You can't find the bug because, you know, that code looks good to you and then it's staring you right in the face that you've got the wrong thing there. And you're like, oh. okay, so it happens to me too. But I think in this case we're okay. It's, it's fine. Yeah. Okay, good. All right, so all right, so that's uh, uh, that's uh, okay. Good. So I wanted to sort of say that, and then the crucial point was is that everything is defined in terms of evaluation. So it's all defined in terms of program behavior. It's all about which I wrote up here. It's all defined in terms of how things run. Okay. So I was making a point about that yesterday because I wanted to contrast. Uh, 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 what happens in a form type theory, which is what I'm going to talk about next, and then I will, uh, uh, yeah, and I will connect the two, and then I'll use that as a transition point. Okay, so that's my that's my plan. Okay, so uh, what do I want to say next? Oh yes, the other thing I want to say is, okay, let's say we've we've understood this. There's there are always things missing in some sense. There are many many fascinating type structures, and indeed, I'm concentrating on ones here that are very, very, very standard. But once you accept the premise that you're working with specification languages for programs, lots of types arise that don't arise very naturally in the formal setting for reasons which I will uh, 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 indicate in a few minutes, okay? So I am sticking to some certain conventional things, but I will mention in particular that Constable over the course of decades has explored all sorts of fascinating type structures that emerge in this setting that I don't have time to talk to you about. So I'll just flag it like that, okay? For example, we've recently found use for what are called intersection types and union types. There are many concepts that make good sense here, but they don't correspond in a formal way to logic, which is kind of my next topic, okay? So let me, let me do that. So, uh, it's a kind of an impoverished type system, and in fact, it's impoverished in one particular way I'm going to emphasize shortly, but anyway, I just kind of want to mention that, okay? So now, let's go back to lecture one, in which I said that uh, what type theory then, this, this form of type theory, I'll, I'll just use type theory to mean what I've been talking about so far. Uh, people mean different things, but okay, so the idea is that it's a theory of programming languages, or it's a theory of computation, if you will. Okay, it's not, depending on your point of view, it's a rather simple-minded theory of computation because it only accounts for purely functional behavior. It doesn't account for effects, at any, at any, uh, and certainly in the form I've given it to you. Okay, yes, I understand that. It doesn't account for complexity, which is like I was talking to you about last week. All right. Okay, but it, it's basically a theory of computation in the sense of like program specification for these kind of functional programs, okay? And before the notion of, uh, uh, so I type theory IV was a, you know, a theory of computation. So everything I've said in the last couple of lectures has all been about program behavior and how they run, okay? And so we're, we're, we're doing this. And one interesting aspect about this is that this was the foundation this idea of programs 
in an era before computers existed at all, so there were no computers. People were thinking about, you probably know this, but if you go back to the founders of the subject, you know, Church and Brower and uh, various other people, I think, uh, were thinking about computation before there were computers. It really is kind of a nice idea, that nice way, it's nice the way that that kind of thing evolved. Okay, but anyway, the point was is that Brower used this, as I mentioned to you before, as uh, a means to give a notion of truth for you know logical or logical formulas or logical propositions. And by now this has evolved and I would just call this what is called the propositions as types principle. And as I mentioned to you last time, I kind of want to distinguish, uh, it's always a terminological problem, so I'm not really quibbling about terminology, but I want to distinguish what I will call the propositions as types principle from, uh, or, which is, has various other names, but the, my important point is uh, it sometimes could be called the semantic correspondence, and it has other technical, in the technical literature it goes by other, other terms like realizability is a word that comes up. Okay, so, uh, but it's a semantic correspondence between propositions as types. So I just want to summarize it for you because in this formulation, it's about how programs run. It's not about formal derivations of things, which is what I'll, I'll get back to a little bit later. So, uh, so the idea is this, okay, is that uh, what, and this is a capsule summary uh, of the ideas, I, I don't want to, go extensively into this. So the, 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 the capsule summary is the following idea, is you have various notions in logic. I'll use the letter phi because that's pretty common. It'll help me to write, to write on the board, I hope in a way that's less, not, doesn't, uh, is a little clearer. It's, you have the idea of a proposition and you have the idea of a proposition being true. Okay, and that's the thing that we wish to explain. So the idea is how do we explain this? Okay, how do we explain this? And I'm, as I say, I'm giving uh, like my personal simple-minded formulation of uh, Brouwer's ideas. That's the, that's the point. And these have been developed print very much by Martin Luff, for example, uh, and I'm trying to give you a summary of those. So the idea is you want to explain what does it mean? What are the, 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 the connectives and so on? The structure of propositions, what are the propositions? And what does it mean to be true? And the way it's interpreted is that a proposition is a specification or a problem. If I write the proposition that says, you know, there are infinitely many primes, and I'll see how to write that down in a minute, then it's, it's stating a problem for you, which is, well, maybe you should see if that's true, or maybe you can refute it. But you could, you could uh, want to see whether it's true. So it's a specification or a problem, and then this is a solution to the, spe solution to the problem, or uh, a program satisfying the specification. Okay, a satisfier, if you want to say that, or as I mentioned before, in the technical literature, it would be called a realizer. Okay, so we can write that down according to the following pattern. So what's going to happen is we're going to associate, I'll call it phi star, last night I couldn't think of a better notation. So I'll associate with it a type, because we've said we're developing a theory of specification. So we have a notion of specification. And, and then what does it mean to be true? It means that this is inhabited. That's the first cut at it. We could then, uh, that, uh, so that is, there, there is, you can find a program, if you will, which inhabits the associated type. And that's uh, like a very beautiful idea, and I'll just give an indication of what phi star is. Probably many of you by now have seen that, but I will, I will just summarize it briefly. But what it is, is uh, it just tells you like what constitutes a solution. So the thing that I kind of want to mention here, which seems important, is that there are, the notion of type is primary. And I believe that the thing that this should correspond to is Brouwer's notion, the idea of the programs that inhabit a type, I think were called constructions, okay? So there has to be the idea of effective computation or effective construction, and those are classified by types, and that's primary. And I also want to say is it's, well, I don't need the word much. I would tend to say much, but let me just say it's more extensive, okay, than merely the things that correspond to propositions. So in particular, uh, 
the correspondence is often described as an isomorphism, and for several reasons, I believe that just isn't accurate. Uh, one of which is, first of all, it's strictly injective. But, but anyway, uh, so the point is that the notion of type is primary, and it's more extensive than mere logic. It's just that, uh, I'll say mere just to be like logic, okay? And this is actually was very explicit in Brouwer's work, as I recall it, where he distinguished, rather than thinking of math as being founded on logic, he thinks of logic as a branch of math or part of math in the sense that, uh, for him, math meant this kind of type theory, I'll use modern words, the type theory that I've been describing, a notion of computation. And then logic is derived from it by this correspondence that I'm explaining. It's rather than starting with it. It's connected very much with my next topic, which is formal logic, and I'll, I'll, I'll explain that momentarily. Okay, so, the, uh, so that's, the, that, that's the general setup. And what does that correspondence look like? I think you're quite familiar. So it's typical, for example, I'll use some typical looking notation. So there's typically there's a proposition which is the trivially true proposition, which corresponds to one, which I also called unit. In other words, as a problem statement to prove that the very the that that the trivially true thing is in fact true, uh, it doesn't require much work. And so I just make one element in here, uh, which is the single element that we have one here. Oh, by the way, because type theory is actually a theory of equality. What you, what you get en passant out of this is also a notion of when two proofs are equal. And um, that's kind of interesting. And en passant, it also gives you a notion of when two propositions are equal, and that's a little bit more problematic, okay? And that I'm gonna use as a motivation for the next stage in my development. Okay, but I'll just put, Question mark there, I'll, I'll say what I mean by that, why I put a question mark there later, but it, it gives you some idea of when two formulas, if you will, specify the same problem, okay? That's an interesting question. I mean, people also often talk about one or two, one or two proofs the same. And I'm not saying this is the master answer or anything like that, but it, it at least broached the subject, okay? And so it's there. Okay, so we can do it like that. If I want, I'll start out with the trivially false proposition, so that will be zero, which we called boy. Now you know why I set this as an exercise for you, because I needed to have it on the table in order to write this diagram. Okay, so that's what happens there. And then uh, I think you're familiar if you look at something like, oh, I was using phi. Let me just continue with that. Phi one and phi two, a conjunction. Well, it poses the problem to solve those two things separately. And so how, what does that mean? It says, give me a solution to this, and also that is, give me the pair of a solution to one thing or another, okay, written like that. And, uh, and then the similar thing happens with disjunction, and this is a famously, uh, a famous issue that caused a lots of consternation and objection, okay, and I'll just write NB here, okay, because this is a constructive notion the construct, this is, this is the spot where things uh, get controversial. So I'll simply say, we're dealing with a constructive notion of truth, okay, in which if you're gonna prove a disjunction, you're required to be uh, forthright about it. And you must tell me, left or right, which one did I solve, and I tell you how to solve it. So let's not go further, I mean, one could, I could, use all of my time talking about such matters. I, I don't, I don't wanna do it. Let's just say that that is a, by definition. It has certain consequences which uh, go under the rubric of constructivity. But Brouwer's position, as I understood it, is to say forthrightly to own it, that this is exactly what it should be, whether you like it or not. Okay, that was uh, historically true, I think. And, uh, 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 okay, so, but let's not take a stand on it. Let's just say this is what the definition is. Okay, and now things some way get even a little bit more, uh, 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 well, so the idea is that what does it mean to construct evidence for or give uh, evidence for an implication? It means to tell me how to transform a proof, which I don't necessarily have, but if you were to give me a proof of the antecedent, I'll turn it into a proof of the consequent. So you would write it like this. So you're saying it's the evidence for it has to be a function. And again, there's another issue here is because of 
such functions have to preserve equality of proofs, and they have to give a unique answer. That is, whatever proof you give, it determines what the answer is going to be in that particular argument. Now, that can also be something that people investigate and argue about, and so let me just call it out. I'll show you an example that a student raised with me yesterday that kind of throws into your eye that you something about this. So I'll, I'll get to that in a moment. OK, so uh, those are the standard propositional connectives. And then what do we do about the quantifiers? Well, we have to decide what we're quantifying over. And already, you see, we need the notion of type. This is why I used phi, because I, I wanted to make sure that they look separate. OK. So whenever I define some notion of quantification, I have to say what I'm quantifying over. So if it were, for example, nat, that is a familiar, familiar, uncontroversial thing, I will allow it to be any type whatsoever in this scenario, any type at all. In fact, it could be in the image of star. It could be because more or less that's the way you're thinking about it. You're, you're quantifying over the proofs of a proposition. But at any rate, the image of star is just some types, and you can quantify over any type. So that's the idea. And so you can guess, so let me write for all that. I, for various reasons that will come up next time, I want to insist on using the little letter A for variables uh, to avoid other problems. OK, so, and so what do we do here? I think you would know what I'm going to do here is I'm going to write uh, this a dependent arrow, and I'll write phi star here. And notice, uh, maybe I could write a subscript A here, because of course, the whole reason you're quantifying it is you depend on it. And so this is the dependent function. So again, it's a functional correspondence. Give me, an, let's say if it were a natural number, give me a natural number, something that inhabits nat, and I will give you back a proof for that instance of the proposition in the body of the quantifier. And then the other one that, again, I'll write it as NB because it was a distinctively constructive idea, was to interpret this as the, uh, I'll write the subscript A here. I haven't done that very often, but I'll just emphasize that. And again, I'll write NB here because this gets into the idea of so-called constructive existence. And let us not dispute what is right and what is wrong or anything. I, I, don't, want, I don't want to do that. I wouldn't be able to do that. Uh, but one could argue with it, let's say. People do, did argue with it. Uh, we understand more now, I think, than when, when those arguments were going on. But it's controversial because in order to prove that something exists, I'm required to actually show it to you. And because if this is the evidence, it means I have to give you an actual A, and then I have to show you that the stated property holds of it. And I'm required to be forthright. So these are like a very forthright interpretation of the connectives. OK, so the thing that is in Martin Luth's paper that a student asked me about yesterday is the, this, uh, the following simple fact, uh, which uh, if I look at what this means, I write it out in logic. OK, I'll, let's write it like this. OK, so and this is in Martin Luth's paper. So this is saying R is total. So if R is a total binary relation, that is, oops, I'm sorry. And, and I also want to stick to my notational conventions, which I wasn't doing, so let me try to do that. OK, that's what I meant to do. So if R is total, then there is actually a function that picks out a witness to its totality, OK, such that for every A and A, R, A, and F of A. And this is simply true. Which means that the corresponding type is inhabited. So the type, maybe I don't need to write it out, but the idea is that the totality says, I have a function. So yeah, I'll write it out like this, because maybe it will help you see why this ought to be true outright. But by the way, this f is sometimes called a choice function. And that's why this, this example even gets pointed out. And that's what a student asked me about yesterday. Uh, and then people say, oh, wait a minute. I thought the uh, choice was like some controversial thing. Well, uh, let me just explain here how it emerges in this setting, because it's inherent in the Brauerian semantics that this must be the case. Then you could argue it means it's not expressing what you thought it was expressing. The definitely long discussions can go on here. But let me just explain why it ought to be true in this setting, because what is happening is, uh, and I wrote it R, 
I'll write R of A and B again just to emphasize that it's in the scope of both of these guys, so I'll emphasize it. So it's saying that if I have this, then I have a function, uh, oops, sorry, yeah, then I have a function from A to B such that, and then that's the cross part for every A and A, I have another function which can give you a, a witness to the fact that A is in fact defined on the little a, which is the witness is f of a, right? So I can do that. So why is this like, so to say, obviously true? The reason it's obviously true is the very meaning of the hypothesis is that I have a function that given any a gives me back not only a b but a witness. So of course, in particular, given every a, there's a function which gives me a b. I just take the first projection here. Okay, so the assumption here, if I write, give this assumption a name and write f colon that guy, arrow this guy, and let's put the parens in here, then what's going to happen is you're going to define f to be, uh, uh, what do I want to say? It's basically, lambda a, a little uh, capital F of a dot one in my notation, the first projection. In other words, the only possible way you can prove something total, relation total, is to give me a function. And so, of course, I can say, oh, and by the way, that means there's a function. And right, it does. So, uh, yeah. Is that arrow, like, implication? Is that arrow kind of... It well, it corresponds to the, oh, this arrow, if I wanted to be strict about my logical notation, you're right. I should have written that right. implies. And that yeah, and then what I'm looking here is its correspondence written in type theory. Okay, yeah, uh, yeah, uh, sorry. But anyway, I wrote it like this just because, as I said, it came up in discussion yesterday. Okay, so I wrote it like that. So the point would be, um, this is sometimes called the axiom of choice. Okay, the problem is the axiom of choice doesn't really pick out a specific thing except in very particular context. So in the context of the set theoretic axioms, the ones you learn in school, there's something called the axiom of choice, and it can be phrased a million ways, but this is one of them. Okay, so you can do this. So why would this be controversial? You can say, oh, what a wonderful thing. This is really great. Or you can say, oh, how terrible. And it all hinges on whether you expect that there should or could be a way to prove a relation total that doesn't exhibit a function that somehow or other, in a some, for lack of a better terminology, in a disconnected way, says for any A, it tells you what the witness is without giving you an algorithm. If that's the case, then it's kind of questionable why there should be an algorithm, something that goes from A to B. But at any rate, in this formulation of logic, it's all self-consistent in a certain sense, and you can like it or not like it, but anyway, it's a self-consistent situation such that this is just a theorem, it's just a fact. You can show that this to be true. So it would be helpful to understand that. In the context of the set theoretic axioms, it's just a comprehension principle. Uh, it, when you write down, as you know, when you want to say a function exists in set theory, you've got to write, essentially, you've got to say a certain set of ordered pairs exists, and you have to use these various axioms of set theory to show it exists. And one of them it turns out to be called the axiom of choice. That's one way to write down a function if we do it like that. And then it's just like, well, whatever. Okay, I don't know. It's, it's not a big deal, okay. Uh, but th and this is not really addressing the same question as what I'm trying to say. It's a, it, it certainly could be called the axiom of choice, but anyway, it's not an axiom, it's the fact of choice. So, so again, this is a kind of a fact, the fact of choice. <laughs> okay, that's, that's what I do, and this is in CMCP. You can see it in there uh, described. Okay, good, I don't want to dwell on that any longer, but it did come up as a question, so I want to do that. Okay, so, um, this is the store. Well, this is the sto uh, uh, yeah. Sorry. There with all the stars and stuff. I don't really know what you did. Like, what is star? I was saying, when I write the thing that looks like a logical formula, what I really mean is the thing on the right. Okay. So the idea is you don't sort of admit that there are propositions, sort of as a separate entity. You just say there are certain types. Because in the truth formulation that Brouwer was giving, for it to be true means I have a program of that type. And so all I need is types. I don't need to worry about anything else. And so that's the idea. And it's a semantics. And it, as I've tried to emphasize, it can be and has been controversial. I, I like it a lot personally. But anyway, 
can be controversial. So, yeah. This may be a meaningless question because I don't fully understand logic, but yeah. in the world where there is, no, we can conceive like there is no algorithm to go from A to B, yeah. would it then be uh, the issue of whether a, the little a and little b are in R in the relation also be kind of undecidable? Are those two things? I, I don't think any. I don't think there's any. The kind of the reason it's the fact of choice. There's no issue of decidability here that I am aware of. I don't think so. No. Uh, so uh, maybe there's something I'm missing. But no, it's not really heard on the top right. The very meanings of logical formulas are given in terms of the existence of programs. And so, but I have a, a type theory is so rich that I can talk about the existence of programs, like it exists a function from A to B. And then I'm just bringing out that fact, that's all. It's a very, it's a non-thing, apart from the fact that it looks like the axiom of choice, okay? Otherwise, it's a non-thing. But I, it came up in yesterday in discussion, so I thought I would mention it, okay. So, all right, so anyway, that's an example. Now, what I want to talk about shortly, and I won't do it right now, is something that's missing, okay, here, because, what am I supposed to do? I'll, I'll write it in this notation. What am I supposed to do about, let's write it like this. What am I supposed to do about equality? I haven't talked about that because any notion of proposition worth its salt, at the very least, has the idea that M and M prime are equal in the type A because we're, I'm using quantification over type, so that's why that would go here. Now you know why I didn't want to write Okay, you're going you're gonna to see all the notational uh, arbitrary decisions I made because I didn't want to get confused with these kinds of things. So, so the question is, what do we do about that? And actually, that's going to motivate that's going to motivate some work, which I'll do uh, momentarily. Oh, okay, I'll I'll do the, I'll do this right now in the semantic setting, and then I'll talk about formal type theory. Okay, because it's an issue. So the question is, how do we interpret equality? Equality as a type. Equality, the proposition of equality as a type. And, okay, this is a, this is a complicated and multifarious thing. But in the setting of computational type, there is a very simple answer. Okay? So what I do is I introduce, wait for it, something called equality types. That's a surprising terminology, maybe, but that's what it is. So we introduce what are called equality types. Okay, and I don't know if you're either if you're familiar with these things or not. It's either dead obvious or it's like bizarre. I don't know. It depends on your point of view. I've I've had other people react in various ways. Okay, so the idea is that I'm going to say, as I've said now, I'll, it's written like this: uh, m and m prime. Okay, I'm going to say that that's a type or equal to another type. And I'll oh damn! All right, let me call this m1 and m2. I get into trouble here. Let's write it like that. Okay. I'm going to say, if and only if A and A prime are the same type, M1 and M1 prime are the same in A, and M2 and M2 prime are the same in A. So the special case of just being a type, this has to be a type and these have to be elements of that type. Okay. So it's the type that's inhabited. So the idea is inhabited exactly when this equation is true, m1 is equal to m2 and a. So what you do is you say, m inhabits this type, let's call it m1, m2, okay, if and only if, m evaluates to, and then it's pretty common to use the, the trivial token star, okay, m evaluates the star, and it is true that m1 is equal to m2 and a. Okay, that, that's, uh, uh, good. So that's our, going to be our definition. And then I will mention some facts about it in a minute. Okay? So that's the, that's the idea. Okay? So the thing that m people sometimes find, I don't know, you may find this weird, I'm, uh, possibly, so let me just mention. So in other words, the idea is there's a terminology that comes in is that the equality type is what is called a sub-singleton. Sometimes people call it that. Well, in a, uh, what do we mean by a sub-singleton? It has at most one element. So it may be, for example, EQ23, that a better, oops, sorry, that should say nat. 
it'll better turn out as it will, okay, that this is uninhabited. Why? Because for it to be, in other words, there's nothing in there. And, and why would that be? Well, of course, these are not equal as natural numbers. Why is that? Because I gave you the definition last time. So, uh, so we will, uh, uh, that would be uninhabited. However, you know, I don't know, two and one plus one, if I had addition around, would be inhabited. And I don't care what it's inhabited by, it's just a fact or not. So in other words, an equation in this point of view is at most true. Okay, that's the idea. All right. There's no interesting information in there about, uh, in the inhabitant about, so to say, why it's true. I'm going to broach that subject momentarily, but this is the first cut. Okay. And so the, the, the main fact about this, so first of all, we can make the following thing. So the fact is, uh, well, I don't even have to state it. It's really by definition, okay, we can say, uh, well, we can write it like this. M is in, it has an inhabitant, you know, if and only if M1 is equal to M2 and A. So therefore, it's kind of nice now I can say the proposition, as I was using it, uh, what does that correspond to? It corresponds to the equality type because our criterion of truth, uh, let's write, uh, oh, no, A here, that's good, M1, M2. Okay, because the criterion of truth is there exists a construction that satisfies it, that is a, satisfies that spec, and so uh, that, that can only be, oh, yeah, the, the, letter, the star here is unfortunate. I'm sorry that I called that star and used this star, excuse me. Okay, but the only possible inhabitant of this type is that trivial token star. And uh, uh, so we can, we can define this, and this idea works, okay? There's nothing wrong with it, okay? This works. Okay, so uh, good. So that's the that's the thing, and what I can, what I can ask you to do as an exercise, because I don't think it's very hard, is you can show, as it were, that EQA M1, or let's say, thought of as just a relation with two arguments missing, written in here. We can axiomatize this at, is inductively as the the least reflexive relation. Binary relation, okay, what I mean by that. Okay, so first of all, it's reflexive, right? Because star will inhabit AQAMM, you know, on A, on elements of A, uh, whenever uh, M actually is in A. Well, that's pretty trivial because this means M equals M and A, which is the definition of M and A. So whenever M is an A, they will be equal and you'll have star in here. And then the idea is that if something else is reflexive, so if R is reflexive, then, uh, or the idea is that I can define an induction principle that says, you know, if I want to show that M and N, equality of M and N gives me that some R holds, okay, uh, R holds of M and N, some relation, whatever, it suffices to show that R is reflexive. And this is defined on A. R is reflexive and it holds, and it holds on, it holds on uh, M and N. Okay, so that's the idea. That is, it has an element, okay, that for every A in A, I want to show there's an element in R of A, A. Okay, so it's a lot like an induction principle. I'm saying the defining principles of the equality type are that it's inhabited by star exactly when an equation holds, and because everything respects exact equality, when M is exactly equal to N, you can say it's the same thing. And so the idea is if it's a reflexive relation, okay, then equality is contained in it. Okay, so that's the, that's the idea. Okay, so you can work that out. So that's, a, uh, and I can amplify if we want to discuss. So we can, we can show that. So it's, this is uh, a kind of thing that could be called equality induction. It's just working on the fact that, yeah, it's working on the fact that, uh, that uh, uh, equality is defined this way as having the only, only that element. Okay, so in the semantics, 
formulation, the semantic correspondence, that's all I'm, I'm going to say. I don't want to amplify it and go any further because I want to now bring up uh, uh, the uh, question of the relation of all this stuff to formalisms and what is called the canonicity property for a type theory. So that's what I'm going to, what I'm going to get next. Okay? Yes? Just real quick, the trivial inhabited star is, is what exactly? Is what, sorry? Is, is what? Oh, I, pick whatever you want. I could have said 17. Okay, I could have said, seven, you know, a star is just a handy, a handy value. It's going to be a value in my operational semantics. It'll be a value. Pick any handy value and use that as your conventional witness to the fact like, that. What's a trivial inhabitant? What is a trivial inhabitant? The trivial, well, I just, because it's just a token star, you know, it's just some value. I could have said zero. I mean, I could have said any, any, anything I have. It's like a neutral. Hang around. It's just the existence of it is all that matters because the formulation is that things are true when they, it's inhabited. So if I want to talk about when an equation is true in this kind of setup, it's enough to just say, well, define a type that's inhabited when an equation is true, and that's what I've done. And you just say it's inhabited and you get it for free because you said it was inhabited. Well, I, I guess if I understand your point. Um, I'm just saying it's inhabited exactly when the equation is true. I mean, uh, in a certain way, I'm not saying very much at all. I mean, yeah. However, it, 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 it impinges a lot on formal type theory in a way. Okay, so that's, uh, that's the, uh, okay, is that okay? Is that, I'll get to that. Uh, to be clear, the, the top line of the bottom board there, yeah. um, that M is in EPA, so on, that's saying that an M, which is this star, exists if this? Or is that saying any M can be said to be in here if this? Uh, where are we, uh, uh, are we, you're looking, where are we looking here? Or yeah, what? right there. Yeah, right here. Okay, yeah, I'm just saying, if it has an inhabitant, that means this evaluates to star, that's the only thing it could evaluate to. Because remember, the definition of membership is M evaluates to a value which is in here. By definition, the only value that's in there is star. So this will, this assumption, if we're going left to right, tells me M evaluates the star, and star being in there means that this is an equation. On the other hand, if I have this equation, then I can really, this type is exactly the same type as M1, M1, okay? And then I can put star in there, so my M will chosen to be star. So there exists an M on this side, if and only if that's the case. That's what I'm, what I'm doing, okay? So it's, it's pretty straightforward. I know people find it disorienting, but uh, my advice is, oh, it's much dumber than you think. <laughs> so it's a very, very, very straightforward thing. Okay. So, However, when talking about formalisms, it's more controversial and it's more problematic. And that's what I want to talk, talk about next. Okay. So, so many times so far in, the, in, in my lectures, I've referred to formal type theory. And I should say a little bit more what I mean by that so that I can mention an important theorem in the application of what's going on here. Okay, so, and I also wanted to say something about what is called the formal proposition, propositions as types principle. Okay, so that's what I want to do. And uh, this will help me, this is just a way of, uh, it's in a way, it's, it's, I think it'll help me make a transition to what I want to do next. So. So the idea is that we now have the notion of a semantics. The other thing we can do is talk about formalisms. And my idea is that formalism. So the idea is that formal type theory, I'll use that word for, to distinguish from what I've been calling computational type theory. Another way to say it is the semantics from the syntax, uh, there are various things, okay, is inductively defined. Uh, is given by, is inductively defined by a collection of rules. For deriving the following judgments, this is I'll write down the typical. The issue is that the I, okay, I'll, I'll explain in a moment. I'll write down typical looking things. Okay, so the typical looking thing is that, as I mentioned last time, we'll have the notion of A as a type. We have this notion of a judgmental equality, and for historical reasons that I don't know how to explain, it's called definitional equality. I, I really, I'm not sure why 
it's called that, to be honest. But for some reason, it's called that. And we're so used to it that I can hardly not say it. OK? I'll explain what it is more in more detail in a moment. But the, my, part of my point is there are a lot of choices here. Oh, uh, sorry, that should have gone on the next line. What I meant to write here would be definitional equality of types to get it to line up here. And then I will have this type checking judgment and what it means here. Okay, so this is again definitional equality. Okay, and we define these by a bunch of rules. So for example, I can't write everything out for sure, but we end up seeing things that look maybe something like this. There are different terminology, which is a, different ways of notating it. But that would be a rule, which is the, the if you suppress the term, it's just the uh, 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 identity principle that the assumption is enough for the conclusion, or it's the use of variables. I can use a variable. So that would be like a typical axiom. You would have a rule that says m is in a prime if m is in a, and a is equal to a prime. Okay, that's a typical rule that we would write down. And uh, to be honest with you, there are dozens. Okay, so let's, let's write down some other ones that look. They're going to look kind of familiar, and, but they have a very different meaning, and that's the thing that I want to get to. So we'll say if uh, A1 is a type, for example. Oh, sorry. We might say if A1 is a type, and A2 is a type, maybe we would have a rule that says A1 cross A2 is a type. Oh, and things of this nature. So we would have a rule. I'm sure you've, I'm, I'm thinking that many of you, if not all of you, have seen this type of thing before. And so I, I won't belabor it, but I want to write it down. Uh, this one would be yeah, cross A2. And uh, similar such things if M is an A1 cross A2. Okay. Then we would write M. I'll write M dot I, if you don't mind. AI, where I could be either one or two. And I'll say et cetera. In other words, we can write down, I'm kind of hoping that, that those look sufficiently familiar. And the crucial thing, oh, and moreover, there will be, let me write, no, before I go to et cetera, let me write down some other things. So a typical, the choice of what is definitional equality is somewhat up for grabs. OK. There is a, a range of choices, because I, I want to say what the ground rules of the game are. And when I do that, I'll mention what governs those choices. OK, so the idea is that, uh, what did I want to say? Oh, right. So a typical scenario is, I'll put some premises up here. But a typical scenario would be, if I'm working with some very elementary thing like this, then if I take the i thing, then I claim that that's equal to m sub i and a sub i provided that, guess what, uh, M1 is an A1 and M2 is an A2. Okay, this would be almost unavoidable. That sort of has to be there, if you will. But sometimes or not, people will take what's kind of the dual or something of this rule, uh, which would say, well, if I take M.1 and I take M.2 and I pair it, I'll call those to be the same under the circumstances. So this is expressing kind of universal condition for the product. And so what, you're, what I'm doing is this is under the condition that this is actually in that type. This is sometimes taken, sometimes not taken. OK, so there's a bunch of these things. So you give a bunch of rules. And the meanings of these judgments is when I write this as an assertion, I mean there exists a derivation. This is a composition of rules. that ends with the particular thing of interest that you might have, like that guy. Okay, So it's defined like that. OK, so that's the idea. So as I mentioned last time, this means that these things are inherently computably enumerable. Or recur I, I grew up calling it recursively enumerable, so I'm probably inevitably going to say that. But, uh, but the experts in the field want us to say computably enumerable, and I understand why. So I'll say it's inherently computably, in, oh, sorry, enumerable, I should say. In other words, 
according to some ordering, I can say, tell me what the ith derivation is for any i. In other words, I can, or another way it is, I can just crank out all the derivable judgments by just applying the rules and just keep doing this. I can do forward chaining, if you will, if you want to talk about that. So in other words, it's always like that. And, but now is the important point about formal type theory because it has a particular purpose. And there is a various design desiderata, design requirements. And principal ones are, one of the principal ones is, and I'll just write it down here, in particular, all judgments should be decidable. So not only are they semi-decidable, which is what that is saying, all judgments should be decidable. Now, what never comes up is decidable with what complexity. That's never considered because when it, they are decidable, it can be really bad. <laughs> Computationally, in terms of the, you know, the uh, computational complexity, it can be terrible. But the right thing is just to say they should be decidable. So in other words, uh, I must be able to tell. So that includes type checking. And that includes as a special case because of the rule in the bottom left board there. In order for type checking to be decidable, definitional equivalence has to be decidable. And I'm not going in a position in these lectures to like explain to you how it comes about that definitional equivalence is decidable. But what I can tell you is it's very sensitive to the definition, okay? for some choices. A uh, choice of what is called of definitional equality. In other words, you're going to fix that as part of your formal type theory, and you're going to do it to ensure that all of the judgments are decidable. There are other criteria, which I won't belabor at the moment, which are called the structural properties of entailment are required to be, you know, in order for the whole thing to hang together in some way. I just want to concentrate on the issue of decidability for the moment, okay? So, but the principal one is these should be decidable. Well, why is that? It's because, there are many ways to explain it, but one way, to, a very pragmatic way to explain it is, the role of a formalism is to be the thing that you implement on a computer. And a very handy thing to be able to do is to write down a term and have it be type checked automatically. Okay, so my epsilon relation, M in A, that's, you have no chance of doing that because for M to be in nat or nat means, for God knows what reason, whenever I apply it to a natural number, it will run and give me back a natural number. This can be an arbitrarily complicated thing. It can be arbitrarily subtle, okay? And then I can write down using dependent types, I can write down even more precise things. It's a function that returns zero when something is the case and non-zero when something else is the case. Could be, you know, okay, it's, you're not gonna be able to noodle about whether a piece of code actually, in fact, carries primes to primes just by examining, you know, the code, no. Okay, so what you do is you introduce these approximations. So the critical idea here is that, from my point of view here of emphasizing the computational meaning of types, the critical point of view is that the formalism, and that's why we have it, is a, you know, I don't know, useful approximation to the truth. And it has to be an approximation. And that was for the reasons I alluded to last time about quantifier complexity. It's set up as exists the derivation so that the, everything you can write here is sigma one, sigma zero one, okay? It's of the form exists the derivation such that something is the case, okay? So uh, of that thing. Whereas the facts you're interested in are not remotely computably enumerable. So it's a useful, no question, but it's an approximation, okay, uh, for the truth. So where this comes up, so that's one way to do it. The other way to do it, the other way to argue why, let me check my time, yeah. The other way to, to argue why this ought to be the case is to say, all right, uh, I can apply this correspondence, which happens to be on my, look at that board discipline, you're impressed, this happens to be not erased yet. Okay, so the, uh, I can apply this correspondence in a formal sense, in the sense that I can say, uh, so this is what the, the formal correspondence is all about. If you take the formalisms I've written down here, what they are doing is they're exactly like 
spare me a little rhetorical devices, okay? They're exactly the same as the rules you would write down for a formal logic of specifying when things are true, except that I make explicit a notation for the proofs. So for example, if I read this guy here uh, in a way that I, let's say, suppress these, these elements, and then I'm saying, if A1 is true, it has an inhabitant, and A2 is true, it has an inhabitant, then suppressing this, A1 cross A2 is true, and A1 cross A2 corresponds to conjunction. So it looks a lot like saying if A1 is true and A2 is true, then, uh, or I have a derivation of it, then I have a derivation of their conjunction. And this just makes the derivations explicit. So the idea, the other reason is that, uh, that uh, via the formal correspondence, and this is what's important here, via the formal correspondence with logic, with, I'll say, formal logics, then, then it should be type checking is the same as proof checking, formal proof checking. One of the, one of the ways in which people get into off in the weeds and in discussions of these things is the words have loaded meaning and it's very hard to find words that don't. So here I mean, a, let's call it derivation checking. How about that? Okay, because the word proof has, is loaded with lots and lots of meaning. So let's just say derivation meaning. So type checking and derivation checking are the same thing. Now that thing goes, the correspondence, I haven't written out formal logic, I just gestured it out. I don't have time to develop it. But the fact that certain formal systems of logic correspond in a very direct way to the formal type theory that I'm writing down is uh, called, you know, it goes by various names. One is the formal correspondence. The other is the so-called Curry-Howard isomorphism. I hate that term. Okay, I really do. Because Curry and Howard, yes, they contributed, but so did lots of other people. I mentioned that last time. And anyway, it's not an isomorphism. It's just, it's just, just some kind of pretension. Okay, there are way more types than there are propositions. They don't correspond at all. And Logic, formal logic, a priori, has no opinion about what equality of proofs or derivations is. And so, like, what do you mean isomorphism? It, it, it doesn't make sense. Okay, so I would prefer, I would suggest not using that terminology. Let's just call it the formal correspondence. So, another way of saying it is, certain type theories are directly inspired by logic. But there's lots of other notions of type that aren't inspired by logic. Just NAT or bool or other things like that don't come directly out of formulas in the usual way. So, so, the, so, the, so there is a correspondence, but these days, it's true by definition. There's no reason not to write down proof terms. You're going to write down a logic, just do it, and then you're writing down a formal type theory and you're done with it. Okay, so it doesn't have... It doesn't have the same force as the semantic correspondence. The semantic correspondence is interesting enough, is interesting enough that it's controversial. You can argue about the semantic correspondence. People pound their fists on the table, okay? Good, because at least the guy is saying something, okay? You cannot argue about the formal correspondence. It's boring, okay? It's like this syntax turns out if you cock your head can just be written in this other syntax and, you know, what's to discuss, okay? That's my point. So according to that criterion, it's not interesting. Okay, that's the, what I'm trying to say. Whereas Brouwer's position was at the very least interesting. Okay, so, so okay, that's, that's what I kind of want to say about that. At least you could argue with it. Okay, all right, so good. So now to finish off for today, because it'll set me up, I thought I would get further today, but I, I didn't. I want to, um, I'll mention now, which is gonna be a motivating thing for us, which is how to axiomatize equality. Or maybe I should use the word formalize because I've been using I've been using that terminology. That is, what is the notion of equality for a formal type theory? And this is, as I've alluded to last time, is a little bit problematic. And the reason is uh, how am I supposed to express the idea of equality as I've explained it to you so far, equality of elements of a type. How do I get this across? So the first cut doesn't work at all because it violates the precepts of having to be decidable. The first cut is you have the following two rules. This is called, uh, these are called equality reflection. Uh, 
okay? And so what you do is you say, the, first, the, the, uh, the, the critical rule is, is this. You introduce a, an equality type and you say, if I have an element of the equality type by a formal derivation, which can be described as M, uh, written down as M, then it's the case, and then you're sort of forced to use this notation because that's my notion of judgmental equality. And this is, this is equality reflection, so I'll write ER over here, okay? And this is a very problematic rule. Try to take that as a rule, and then you would also write, for example, okay, it's usually written, I, I would write it something like this that says, well, if two things are equal, then, okay, I have to decide what to put in here. You could just mimic what I did uh, semantically, but it's going to cause other problems, which is I would write down EQA M1, M2, written like here, okay, for example, or, but the problem is, is that a lot of times people want to decorate terms with more information to facilitate uh, mechanical type checking. So a lot of times this would be written something like reflexivity in A, and I could write M1 here if I want to, okay, arbitrarily, or I can, there's different ways to jigger the rules. So, but more or less something like that is the case. There are, there are different formulations, but more or less something is the case. You just give information that it's reflexivity with respect to, let's say, M1, because M1 and M2 are equal, so I can replace one by the other, and so that's really a use of reflexivity. Okay, so that's what you, what you would do. Uh, the problem is this guy right here. Okay, because suppose I'm trying to check mechanically whether these two things are definitionally equal. Well, you have to be able to read this rule backward. You have to say, well, one of the ways it can turn out that these are equal. I gave you one way over here. I can just write down specific principles. So you could kind of maybe think of devising some algorithm, which I'm not really explaining here, for deciding these kinds of things. But what do I do here? I now have to do proof search. Because in order to get M1 is equal to M2 and A, I have to find an M which inhabits this type. So now I'm doing proof search. Now I'm, you can, it's, this is the thin edge of the wedge. Now you can realize, uh-oh, something is seriously wrong, okay? This isn't going to work because this threatens or actually compromises this ability. Okay, that's, that's, the, that's the problem with that. So usually people make all sorts of bad noises around this guy. Oh, by the way, there's terminology which isn't, is this, is, this approach is sometimes called ETT for extensional type theory, but amongst the many overused words, extensional is one of them. So maybe it's not so helpful to use that word, but let's just call it ETT, okay? So this is strange. So at the very least, what's happening is, a priori, this relation was supposed to mean they're the same by virtue of trivial evidence-free calculations, very simple calculations, okay? This now turns it into a whole other problem because, you see, if I have, let's say, the natural numbers around and I have a variable of type nat, then this m can be a proof by induction that some equation holds. So now you're expecting, you know, going backward, you're expecting to say, oh, there's probably some, there might be some inductive argument that says these two things are the case, and it changes matters entirely. So as a matter of formalism, this is a non-starter because the premises of formal type theory are this decidability amongst other criteria, and I don't want, and I, I can't compromise that. So then the question becomes, and I'm running short of time, I'm sorry, uh, the question becomes, what do you do? And the standard answer is, you instead axiomatize the idea of the least reflexive relation, which I remarked before about the, in the semantic setting. I axiomatize something to be the least reflexive relation, and then you realize that it doesn't mean the same thing as what I meant a little while ago, and in particular, it does not work for function types. And then that leads to 
uh, oh, that is going to be, I'm going to use that as a device to make a transition to talking about identification. That is an evidence-full notion of equality. I don't know the words get overloaded. So I'll, I'll start speaking about that next time. And so, okay, so I think this is a good stopping point for me. And anyway, they're going to take the cane and yank me off stage, so I'm late. So, okay, so let's, let's stop here and then we'll pick up. I think I'm next on Friday, I'm pretty sure. I think I'm on Friday morning, if you look at the schedule. Uh, okay, good. Thanks for your attention. <laughs>